welcome to yet another session of Dr. Spotfire Office Hours. I am Dr. Vishakha Muju, your host for this session. Learning is not driven by answers, but by questions. Once again, we encourage you to post your questions with hashtag Dr. Spotfire. This is my crew. I have with me today Divya Jyoti Rajdev who is a data scientist at DIPCO and uh, she would be presenting today's featured session on our graphics within uh, our graphics in Spotfire. There is Alexis with us. She's our campaign architect. We are all based out of Palo Alto. And we will start our session with the featured session which is our graphics in Spotfire. Uh, can you just pa pass the ball to Divya Jyoti Rajdev? Hi everyone. Uh, are you able to see my screen with Spotify on yes. it? Yes. Awesome. So this actually comes from questions that have been asked on community several times about how do we actually get our graphics to work in Spotfire. So Spotfire has a rich palette list of graphics that you can configure. There's also JSWiz, but sometimes for certain libraries or certain domain specific areas, you just need a very unique R graphics slot in Spotfire. So today we're going to look at a few different ways of being able to configure those and what are your options actually of getting started. So as you can see, I on each of these pages, I have my reserve script, which is for demonstration purposes, and then I'll go through the data function. So the ground principle is that we use R and R. So R and R is a package and I'm working out of the, by the way. So r and is a package written in Cisco Enterprise Runtime for R so that we can invoke different uh, open source R functionalities. So over here, I'm using the R graph function inside r and Now R graph returns me a binary object that contains the graph image that is generated inside the function call. But there's a very unique syntax, and the unique syntax is essentially if I remove uh, about this much. So you have our graph, and then this is where you would have your visualization call. So over here I'm using GG Ally, which is a library built to support DG plot. Uh, you will have your Wiz call over here, but you need to specify the package and the data. So the package has to be installed in open source R. So for example, if I'm using GG Ally, I would go into wherever my R installation is. So right here, and I'm using the latest one, go in all the way and do install.packages with my uh, GG Ally over here. So I've already done that, so I'm not going to repeat that step, but that is critical. In order to be able to reference the packages, they, because you're calling out to open source R, they need to be installed in open are, and then you specify the data table. Now if I go through the syntax of the call, first of all, why am I using this functionality? GGPAG is really nice in the way that you can see that not only, a lot of times we look at pairs plot to find out correlations, associations, etc. But GGPAG takes it one step further by looking at the data type that you've got. So my uh, sex variable is a factor. My other variables are numeric. So it would have different combinations for, let's say, uh, numeric and numeric. So you can see numeric and categorical is a box plot. 
then numeric and numeric is a scatter plot, but numeric with itself is essentially just the density curve. And you have very nice little, uh, just visually, I can see what the trends are. Like I can see there are some outliers here, the trends are good and so on. That's how I'm using this. It's important to reference the actual viz call by a print statement surrounding it. And what that does is that whatever object is generated, it just prints it to the R graph uh, input. And that comes out as your output property. So using this, you can do a lot of graphics that are very commonplace in R, but have yet to be defined in Spotfire, like ggjoy for joy plots, the nice density curves overlaid on top of each other. You can do complex heat maps, circular bar charts. You can add density rugs below charts, area charts, and you can also generate your own infographics. Just an example of how the script works is I've got all of these in script. So if I go in and show you, this is exactly the output that I have over here. And then in my input parameter, I have table one that's coming from my Spotfire table and the output is a binary property. So this would be my output and this is my input parameter. So if I go in and in the text area, show you how it's configured, is that this is just your property that is generated. So I generated the R graph package property with this particular script, and that's what I've inserted as a label. So I can go through the steps so that it's easier. So this question has come up on community a lot of times and people approach it from a very roundabout manner of creating an image and then reading in the image or writing to a particular cell of a table, which are all valid approaches, but they're too complex. So this, in our opinion, is the simplest way of accomplishing the same result. So I can show you how I just took uh, the R graph package image and here it is, it gets generated and saved. And that's all, two-line script. Other examples of the kinds of things that you can do with this are this particular one is for generating color schemes in Spotfire. So let's say I have a bar chart and now I want to generate it. Let me choose another data table. So. Uh, no columns. And now I want to generate some kind of a gradient color scheme or some kind of a categorical color scheme to color all of this. The traditional way would be I go into properties and colors, choose my column to color by. So let's say I choose this. And then you would go in and either change it by hand or go to more colors and be able to define your uh, color schemes over here by selecting the slider. A lot of times you might just want to create these values that you can directly input there. So what we've done is in the R Color Brewer package, and again, R Color Brewer right now uh, it's installed within my third because my R graph, I'm only calling out to pi. So this pi I'm creating in open source R in order to get it printed, but the color brewer I am calling from term. So I have given a slider of the number of colors that I want to select, so I can increase or decrease it, and you can see that the tonality is increasing. And that comes from color ramp palette and just increasing the tone. And for my R graph, I'm just printing out the pi with the same length number of sectors as the divisions of my uh, cool vector. And that gets colored by this vector. So I've also given an option for the user to input their palettes. So these are the R color blue palettes that are available to you. 
And right now we're working with a gradient color scheme because it's all tonal and all one color. Let me show you what it would look like with a categorical color scheme. So now I've used set three from over here, and as I increase or decrease my number of sectors, they get generated. And this is my vector in hash values, but you can use any other function like um, hex to RGB or hex to HSV and so on on top of this in order to generate the three columns that then you can directly copy and paste it into um, the custom colors. So we find this very useful every time, especially if you've got you know a company theme, let's say variations of blue and orange, and you need to generate sectors inside of it. The reference for this is very important. We absolutely love uh, the R's uh, graph gallery. It's an amazing website, and it contains a very rich set of visualizations. So for example, this one. This visual uh, circular bar chart, extremely popular. I'm not entirely sure if this is the best code to generate it though, but it could be extremely useful to have that inside spot fire as let's say a gate chart or a measurement uh, for your convenience. So if you have multiple drill downs, let's say from chart one to chart two, finally you could end up as at a R graph. The reason why that's possible is if I go into data function and show you for the color R graph, in the parameters, when you specify the inputs and outputs, you can still select the properties. If I go to interactive graph and edit parameters, I have all the columns listed, but if I wanted, I could limit it just like any other data function by marking rows or by filtered rows or input my own expression, search expression to limit it by. With respect to this particular script, uh, it's calling out to r, &R it's calling out to color brewer, it's creating the brewer palette with the property from the slider, and the property two is holding the type of palette that you want, in case the value exceeds nine, because by default, color brewer for most palettes just gives you nine. So I'm adding tones to it manually. That's a little optimization that I did on my own. And then we're just printing out a pie chart. You don't have to print out a pie chart. You could like use a call or a bar or anything else, but I think it's quite nice to visualize it as a color wheel. So let's say you're working with pure uh, color theory. You'd be able to see the monochrome. You'd be able to see contrasting colors quite clearly. So that's the intuition behind using the color scheme. There's a fair bit of echo going on. So if everyone, anyone's uh, speaker is on and you're in a place that generates echo, could you please put yourself on mute? Thank you. Finally, uh, what I wanted to show you was the ability of doing prototyping very, very quickly using our graphics. So Spotfire has got its own ability to embed data functions, and you also have a number of modeling options available out of box. But let's say over here in this graph, we can see I wanted to model um, a person's height according to their age, and I wanted to separate it by the two populations which are genders. I wanted to have a separate model, the female, and model the male separately. So the reference for this comes from our graphics cookbook textbook by Winston Chang, extremely useful, where what they've done is they've taken um, the table and they've generated, like been able to create a predicted column for the different ranges and called a ggplot on it. So it's just separating out the male population from the female population. You could do it for any other categorical column. You could do it for multiple categorical columns and fitting a model on top of it. So here, uh, 
what is interesting is that you can now codify it. So instead of showing it on ggplot, I could take the code up to here. And I started at the very beginning. So I started at like a little bit of data wrangling. I created my own model. I created my own vector of output. But I very quickly am able to simply visualize it using ggplot. And so if I go in and show you the code for that, it's exactly the same, but I wanted to change an attribute to show you that there's no sort of hand waving going on over here. It's all in the script. So, all right, edit script. And if I scroll down, you can see that right now the model is the linear model. Actually, it's the lowest model, but let me run that again. So let's take a GLM uh, and save it. And now if I refresh my script, uh, my parameters should get refreshed. Oops. Do I have a typo? Okay. Save, close, refresh. And it takes a second, and if you notice that my um, lines became straighter. So we started at a lowest model, and that gave you a little more curving, and now I've got a linear model. So you can do this with multiple families. You can do this for splines. It's a very effective tool in rapid prototyping. So this was all with respect to in Spotfire. There's another interactive our graph, which is lesser known that we provide through TUR. I want to quickly show you an example of that. So this comes directly from the TIPCO spot file. Everywhere I've cited my references, so if you needed to go back and try out these examples, there will be a community page coming out also about this by the end of today, and we can uh, follow up on that. Please provide your feedback in after the session if you want to request an email with the link to the community page showing all these examples and a few more in some detail. So this comes from uh, the documentation of our graph in STIR, and Vishakha can send you that on chat right now. So we're just grabbing a file from a GitHub repository loading the library ggviz, and we're working in TUR. So if I show you my tools and options, you can see that I am connected to my TUR. I'm using 4.3. And I'm going to go in and run these few lines. You can see my variables got populated. And now I'm actually going to create the interactive graph. And that comes right within your R Studio window. It's uh, completely customizable. So if your orientation of console or these panes was different, you would get a sideward, uh, the slider move as you just saw. And this is an example of fitting like a regression line. You can change the aesthetics of point opacity, point size, but you could also provide other variables to the line like displaying the standard error bands and so on. So this is available out of our studio. So in a lot of ways, we are helping you to rapidly prototype and then production into the work. I also want to mention uh, JSViz, JavaScript Visualization, which is another very effective method of customizing the visual that are not available out of box, or even the ones that are available out of box. If you want to change certain attributes of them or do something extra, JSWiz is excellent, and we've had a few older sessions, featured sessions with Andrew Berridge showing off JSWiz. So again, let us know if you'd like that to, if you'd like us to cover that in more detail. Over to you, Vishaka. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Uh, can you just uh, make me presenter?
So this is the list of questions we have kind of uh, selected for today's session. Uh, so we had a question on uh, Twitter as well as we had a question on community uh, about Gantt chart. So there was there was an article published on Gantt chart, uh, and we we have this like how to create the Gantt chart. So there is already a blog which has been posted on community as well as uh, there is a community article with the DXP file which can be downloaded. So let me kind of. Uh, share with you the DXP file. So this is the DXP file which is already available for download and this would be the link uh, for that community article where you can kind of uh, scroll down and there would be a zip file and this is the DXP file which you can kind of download from community. Uh, DJ would provide you the link on the uh, chat panel. So let me go directly into the DXP and kind of walk you through how we can actually create a, a Gantt chart. It's not a Gantt chart visualization, it's basically a scatter plot which is kind of represented as a Gantt chart. Now before uh, I kind of show you, let me show you the table. So this is the data where I have type phases. So phase one, phase two, phase three, each activity. I have a task whether it started or ended. Uh, I have a week, which week it started, which week it ended, what was the duration and um, uh, week number. So, so I have kind of all the details. It is possible you don't get data in this kind of format. Uh, it may be a kind of a in one line you might have, oh, the start date is this and end date is this. But within Spotfire, you can always use transformations to kind of uh, change your data into short, wide, tall, skinny. I won't go into transformations. We have other sessions where we have discussed those transformations. So right now, this is the data, and I want to kind of use it to create a Gantt chart. So there were a few things which I have done here is uh, I had switched this visualization to a scatter plot. So you are looking at a scatter plot. Now, when you go to this here, you are looking at each week number, and you are looking at each phase. Within each phase, you are looking at each activity, and then you are seeing whether it is planned or actual. So, so there are like multiple values here. So, so if I select here week number, so I have week number, then I have phase. So within each phase, then I add activity, and then I add the status. So you can see all those kind of dots show up. If in each, each phase I have multiple activities, then I have start and end date, and I have kind of these dots showing up. But it is not something which is closer to this, where I have, um, I'm looking at actual and planned, so I'm not looking at task status. Uh, I'm looking at type, so I have at planned and actual. So, and you can see like I have these phases and then activity, I have these combined. So there are like a couple of things which you would have to do. Now activity, you can see it's not slotted. So I have like activity one at top and here I have kind of uh, this not in a sorted way. So what, what we have within a scatter, a scatter plot is when we are looking at, we can reverse the scale. So. The moment I am able to kind of reverse the scale, I can see these kind of showing up. Now another thing I would say is which was not done here is uh, my activity 10 should be last. So it's just reversing the scale uh, which has kind of uh, given me this way. Otherwise what I could have done is I could have uh, used the sort order also. So there was another option where I could have picked up uh, my activity and I could have created a sort order where I could have said that, okay, this should be the last one. Uh, I want a custom sort order. I could have picked that and this should be the last one. So then I would see this sort order like this. I would have applied it. Okay, uh, and then I, I'm able to see that kind of fixes that issue. I have activity one at top and I have activity 10 at the bottom. 
Now you can see there is a kind of progression going on and you see all these points here. Now again, when I go back, uh, I, I have used hollow markers and I have colored by actual versus planned. So um, in this case, I am using color by actual versus planned. So let me go to color. Uh, not by phases, uh, but by uh, type, so it's actual versus plan. And then I'm also using shape as hollow markers. So I, I have, I have again, the shape by, if you go back here, right now, you can see actual and planned are showing up as two different colors. So that color path we have kind of uh, used. But I am also using shape by start and end based on the task status. So I can kind of add here shape by task status. And then what I'm doing is I have kind of used hollow markers. So I can go to shape. I can change these to hollow markers. So starting point or maybe then ending point. So you can kind of see now these are hollow markers and you see start and end. Now you have everything you want to see where the activity started, where the activity ended. Uh, now still there is this line which connects to them, uh, to the start and end point. That is something which is line connection. So I'm using each line by each activity and each type. So there would be a line which will represent each activity and each type. So those two dots, which are my task status, they would kind of get connected. So again, I can go here, back here, and I can kind of say line connection. Uh, now before, uh, let me, let me show you this is, this is what we are expecting, a line here. I can increase the width, I can change the color or, uh, whatever way I want so I can see those values. Uh, if the type is not there, you can see it's like all activity. So activity one, all the points of activity one, which are these four points, they are getting connected. I could connect the points based on phases. I could connect the points based on any value. So in this case, I don't want just activity. I want multiple values. So I'm taking type also. So I can see, okay, each activity, each type has a one line and I can kind of see it as a Gantt chart. Uh, then another thing which has been kind of added here is uh, is this line. So my current day I assumed is day nine. So what is it? It's a simple line uh, which has been created uh, with fixed value as nine. But it could be actually a date column or it could be actually something which could be coming from a property where you could add a line so that you see that, okay, on day nine, these are the activities which have been completed. This is the activity which has been completed and the data reflects. So it was in a purpose to show that when new data comes in, you could see this line moving uh, forward and you could see the activities which were actually happening, they kind of showing up. I can see here for activity three, there was a um, delay in actual, which kind of led to delay in activity four again, which kind of led to activity five, but then activity six, we started early. So kind of some kind of cover up there. So uh, it's not a full-fledged Gantt chart. It's a scatter plot, which has been used to represent as a Gantt chart. There is uh, definitely kind of a custom Gantt chart visualization. But uh, in this case, what I wanted to use was out-of-box functionality without any kind of code or without any kind of uh, uh, with out of box and kind of uh, wrangling the data, I would be able to kind of create a Gantt chart visualization, which kind of shows each activity, how, how it is planned, where the status is and um, uh, can be used in kind of project scheduling. Uh, so that's about the Gantt chart. Uh, let me pick up the next set of questions. Uh, any questions so far on Gantt chart? Uh, so I have a couple of questions here uh, regarding over function uh, and some uh, kind of uh, calculations. Uh, I would just pick up one of this and then kind of move on to over function. Uh, so this is a question about if statement where uh, uh, whenever they are using if condition, there is some kind of rounding happening with the values. 
Now the rounding happens with the format. So there are multiple um, multiple reasons when you can see a rounding happening with any set of data. So if I have a data table uh, and I have some values, so for example electronics. Uh, now if I go to edit column properties and I look at the electronics column, uh, it is currency. I might change the formatting so it's not currency, it's a number. Depending on whether it has a decimal points or not, whether it is like, um, even if there could be decimal points as zero, uh, you could see that uh, you automatically uh, see this uh, kind of rounding up. There might, in this case, there are no, nothing after the decimal point, uh, but still, like, depending on how you select the format, uh, this, this would be like the base. So I have a column which is electronics, which is kind of real now. Um, now, whenever I insert a calculated column, any calculation I insert, and I use electronics, so you can see, since electronics was currency, it automatically picks that formatting at currency. Now I pick up and I divide it by three. Uh, I still have it as currency. Uh, let me change. Let me change the data type here, uh, right here itself. So I have the uh, date. Uh, I have conversion functions which can kind of help me changing the data type as well. So I can change it to date. I can change it to. Depending on like whatever you have, you can parse your date. Uh, I will use the real. So I have this uh, real and I want to show you that automatically you would see it kind of shows real with formatting. So here I can say my formatting should be two or my formatting should be three. Now I would divide it by two and it would still remain uh, kind of a real. So whenever you are writing calculations, you got to look at this place. So when you are using if, so it's possible that when you are saying if greater than zero, it's because of the zero, it's kind of now returning it as a Boolean. So you, you, you are in this condition, you are returning it as a Boolean. And then uh, when you have say, uh, if real electronics is greater than zero, then what value you want. I want one uh, or I want uh, two. So so it's integer. So see I am giving, I am saying but if this condition is returning me a Boolean data type which is true or false. But after condition, depending on what column I am giving or what is the data type of that column, it is kind of taking it as integer or I can say 1.0, I can say 2.0. So depending on the data type of that column, you can see here the data type changes. So uh, so whenever you are writing your calculation, that's what you have to be aware of, like what is the data type. So by default, whatever is the data type of column, uh, unless like you use a condition where uh, something was real based on this condition, the output of data type is expected to be Boolean, it changed, uh, but if there are other calculations which do not change, make any change in the data types, it will be the base column data type which would be by default taken. Uh, and once, uh, if you are like sure that you have to use real, so just adding the point zero that would kind of make the change, it won't be taken as integer, it will be taken as a real. So uh, th that could be something which kind of leads to it. Again, in these kind of questions, it will always be good to kind of share the DXP with kind of anonymized data so we can actually kind of see uh, what is happening because this is basically uh, the theory behind the formatting so you can actually change the formatting specified so there are a number of places, so that's why I showed edit column properties where actual column properties are kind of decided what formatting it will have. But then based on here, I change electronics from currency to real and then in within calculation, I could have got this output as integer or real based on what I select here. Um, so if there are like 
this i could have now type as integer or real uh, that's how kind of it is De uh, decided so uh, the same thing happens when you load data so if you are loading a new column and you forcefully at the beginning say it is not real it is integer it would automatically get rounded and uh, once it gets rounded later on uh, if you will kind of add uh, two decimal places it will be dot zero zero so it's something like I loaded something as 2.6 and I said, oh, it's an uh, integer, so it will become 2. Uh, and then later on, even if I change the formatting and say it's now real, it will be 2.00. That 0 0.6 would be lost. So, um, so this is usually with integer and real type of conversions. And these are the places where you can kind of uh, fix those issues. So then I have another uh, question is, how do I place two separate date columns? So how do I place two separate date columns? So I'm tracking deliveries by date order taken and date order delivered. In a line graph, I need to display two lines based on these two date fields. However, there are different dates on x-axis. The number on each line gets thrown off. Any suggestions on how this can be solved? I had no luck with Google searches. Uh, now, I exactly don't understand what are the values, which is date order taken, or what is the use case. Uh, but I still kind of tried to uh, just have this um, data, uh, something as each store location, each store, some electronic shopping was done, somewhere it was ordered, which is here, like date joined, and then where it was delivered. Uh, so again, there ha may be different values for this. Something um, was ordered on this date, uh, and what do you want to represent? So basically, if I have a line chart uh, and I want to show date joined, uh, I'm showing some electronics. And then I want another line chart, basically, uh, which is which is date uh, kind of uh, delivered. And uh, do I still want to see uh, the same thing? Like, do I still want to see uh, this sum of electronics? So that would be kind of a question. Uh, so basically, what I understand is you want to kind of have these two line charts together instead of two separate ones. You want to kind of have these uh, two line charts one on another. Uh, and you can see here the dates are different. Here, uh, let me have date joined, date delivered, or this would be date joined. So, so you want kind of this. So here it is 2010. Here it is 2011. So definitely, uh, uh, you want these as two kind of separate, uh, separate kind of uh, line charts uh, together in one visualization. That's how I kind of interpret it. But again, if you share your data, if you share your DXP file uh, with us, that would kind of help us uh, kind of understand it more. Now, in this case, what I would do is I would not kind of use kind of two dates here, I would kind of transform this. I would use spot fire transformations to get these two, this row into two. So what I will do is I will insert, um, I will add a data table. I can add another data table. I would say I want to uh, use my existing data table, and I want to uh, unpivot it. I would say as store location, store number, customer ID, customer day, gender, whatever it is, I want to keep both of them same. And then I have electronics also. So so what I have done here is I, instead of having single row, I have got two rows. So I have separated this date joined and uh, date delivered. What I will do is I will have a line chart based on date, but then I will use color by this option so that I will have two lines, one for date joined, one for date delivered. So let me call it the date type. And uh, this could be the value, which is actually the date. Uh, I could click OK. OK. Now, in this case, when I create now a line chart, uh, I would pick up that uh, test data, and I have this value. I have electronics, I can say color by date type. I have two lines. So I can actually track, this is the time things were ordered, this is the time things were kind of delivered, 
then within each location i could kind of further kind of trellis things by each location i could say okay give me uh, each store location or give me each customer id and show me each customer as separate so i could kind of pick up that and i could trellis my graph and see okay uh, this is how the boston order and delivery happened this is how los angeles order and delivery happened uh, again i have to decide what is my why is it the same value or are there multiple y axis is it going to be separate uh, but this would be the uh, kind of an uh, out of box solution here where you are kind of uh, using date type like you are separating date type so that your x axis still stays stays the same i could directly kind of use this value not kind of segregate into month or something and kind of see the bare values further i could uh, since it's a date type i could use uh, this year month option also like i'm looking at each year each month and then i'm seeing where the order date and order delivery kind of happened and i'm looking at uh, some of the electronics or any value for that kind kind of date so there might be more deliveries done that's why you see peak on that particular date because it's an aggregate of whatever was delivered on that date so whatever was ordered on that date uh, so this would be a way to kind of resolve it so that was another question which i had uh, for today uh, then what i have here yes. Vishaka, before you move on to the next question, uh, there's a follow-up on the previous one saying, are the conversion functions limited to a certain version? And no. uh, the user is saying that they could not find the real command. So if you could just go through, and the real command has been existing since I believe the first or second Spotify version. So Yeah, I, I, I'm for sure about 2.2. So I started using Spotfire since version 2.2 and in 2.1 also I know 3 4 5 6 7 this it has been always there you can kind of do real so this would be here all functions uh but yes uh, there is a possibility which uh, which usually doesn't happen uh but if i go to kind of inform me, i i am not connected online uh, to the server uh, it is possible that spotfire administrator can uh, kind of uh, have these privileges off and on usually nobody does it to that level but it is possible like you don't have access to scatter plot you cannot create one it is possible to kind for a spot fire administrator to kind of switch off that option uh so uh, i can kind of go through details uh in maybe um next session about the administrator privileges but i have not seen usually anyone doing it so but it is that there is a possibility that because of that or any other reason you don't see but all these conversion functions uh this like base 64 encode these may be latest but the real date that changing to currency lot of these have been uh, since version 2.1 can you also discuss pair underscore real uh yes so uh, so we have statistical functions here uh, also uh, so these are tear uh, kind of aggregation functions uh, this calls the typical enterprise runtime for r and returns an output of this data type so uh, based on what your calculation is within tear uh, you can uh, your script will return that particular data type so for example it's real so output may be median plus median 2 uh, you may be kind of doing a calculation may be passing your inputs as a customer name uh, so in this case uh, that would be uh, your output so these uh, these all tear kind of uh, expressions they are uh, again they have uh, the data type kind of defined what is expected uh, as an output data type uh so these are uh, these are again kind of uh, set of uh, functions which can be used any other questions or follow up questions no that's all okay so there is another question which is an interesting question about over function uh 
and uh, thanks for sending the DXP file and uploading and providing all the details here. Uh, so what we have is uh, this is this is a over function where uh, you want to calculate current month value. You want some variance to be calculated. Uh, now here the question is not clear, uh, but the DXP which has been kind of uploaded as a zip file. Once again, uh, earlier the DXP was uploaded, but it's not possible to kind of download it. Whenever you are uploading DXP or any kind of re uh, images is fine, you can upload them as PNG. But if you are uploading a DXP file, make sure you zip it and then upload it. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we cannot kind of download. So if I try to download this DXP file, this is what I would get. So I would have no clue uh, what the DXP file is. So you, you, anytime you are uploading uh, your uh, resources onto community, make sure if it, it has a DXP file, it has to be kind of, you zip it and then you kind of upload it. Now I received this DXP file and let me go here. And once again, thanks for providing a detailed explanation of what is expected. So this is a made up data table with 600 records with one numeric column which is tax amount, some categorical column division serving as dimensions in the cross table. Now uh, then there is a cross table where you want to see current month value, three previous month averages, variance between the two. Uh, and there is some expected result where which may be done somewhere else and there is a kind of a line chart where you are looking at the tax amount and by each division which is current month. Uh, so let me start with this line chart and kind of for others. So uh, if I have a, uh, this line chart where I'm looking at date time month and tax amount. So tax amount and color by division. So I'm looking at each division and I'm looking at the current tax amount. Now I will start with out of box aggregations in this case for variance or for uh, this and then I will kind of move on to uh, other values. So what I can do is instead of color by let me remove it and let me use trellis so that I can show each division separate. So let me use trellis by panel so that at a time we are looking at only one. Uh, or let me use pages. Okay, so I still have uh, this A, B, I have still these values. So if I scroll down, I can see all of them. I can see D, E division, E, G, A, B division. And I'm looking at current month amount. Now I need to have three months average. So what I can do is I can take another tax amount instead of sum, I can take moving average. Now moving average gives me option to show moving average based on interval size. I don't have to write this calculation. I can just pick three. Do I need to exclude incomplete intervals? Which means whatever is like first interval which has only one value and second which has only two values, there are those two are. Uh, so if it is January, Feb, those January, Febs are incomplete. I can exclude them or maybe I can include them as well. So. Uh, if there are empty values, do I want to hide them? So I have all these options. And once I close, I can see I have these. So it, it actually the value starts from March because here it is like, um, it's not actually uh, three months because I have only January available here, then Feb, and then I have March. So I, I, I can see my moving average, which is my three month moving average. Then I can calculate uh, any other aggregation as well. So all these I have are out of box aggregations and I can say, okay, I want moving average, I want difference, I want difference per cent. Uh, so these are, these are out of box available and uh, I can see the difference also. I can see difference between which two values you want. So you, we can calculate that as well. Uh, so these are already available uh, uh, in the spot fire out of box. So whenever, whenever you are working with moving averages, these kind of help. Not only in line chart, in a cross table also. So let me go to a cross table. So what I have is each division uh, and I have each category. So let me kind of change this to each division. 
So this is my amount. I can add moving average here as well. So I have tax amount. I can say, okay, give me uh, this moving average and give me three. And I can add these. And you can see the incomplete ones, when you use out-of-box aggregation, the incomplete ones show as blank because uh, those are not kind of calculated. Uh, so so you, you are able to kind of see even if you exclude or include, uh, then you can see these values. So if you include, then you don't see them as blank. If you kind of include them, uh, so depending on what is your choice, you can see those values. So this is this is how kind of I would start if I know I have to have three month moving average. But in this case, there was a calculation where you wanted kind of it to be this minus this divided by this. So what I did was instead of kind of looking at division, so so what happens is when you use over calculation, you are using give me axis dot columns. So once again, I would kind of uh, uh, tell you about how over actually works. So if I have a bar chart, I'm looking at a calculation which is um, tax amount by each category. So this, 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 for this, I am getting, this aggregation is calculated by divisions or kind of slicing done by category. If I say color by uh, division, I have further slices, so I have like kind of a uh, five into uh, five into five. These twenty-five slices, I get tax amount for each slice. Now, if I say some tax amount overall, or say let me use custom expression, I use over keyword, and I use in over function, I use let's say all over all axis dot x. So what does what it means is it is giving me that calculation, but now it is not looking at each slice. It is looking at all the slices by axis dot x. In this case, all the slices by axis dot x are categories. So I am getting one value for each category. So so that's why you can see. Uh, and but further, there is a slicing happening by each division. So so I am getting. I'm not getting value for n uh, category. I'm getting value for n plus o plus b plus q plus r. So that's why I'm getting the bars of same height because now it is not separate. It's over all categories. But within each categories, the slicing is still happening because my color slice says, oh, give me a separate, within that category, give me separate for division. So in a way, this would be total of a, b for n uh, for all these categories. Now, if I change it, if I change it to axis dot color, I'm still seeing all the calculations, but now all the colors are kind of is added up. So I can see N O these bars having same, but you see the color; these are kind of same. Uh, within that, these are the same. Uh, so, so it is calculating all the divisions together but it's still segregating them by each category. So if you have multiple things which are creating these uh, kind of segments or what I would call as uh, these small data subsets, whenever you are using over, you need to think about multiple things. So what is happening in your cross table is, in line chart that is not happening in your cross table, when you are using uh, this, you are saying date time, and here your axis dot column is date time. It's not only date time, it's also these columns, these multiple values. You are saying, okay, give me last periods, not only date time, but all these multiple periods as well. So uh, in a cross table, because you are using here to show it by column names. In a line chart, you could have, instead of column names, used color by. Uh, that's why you don't see it there as apparent. Uh, but in case of cross table, you don't have a kind of color by option, like where you can show as separate. If it would be trellised, uh, it was easy. But in your case, the solution is, instead of date time on the top, use it on rows. So I still have date, time, month by rows. I'm using division and I'm using column names there. Instead of saying uh, in your calculation axis dot columns, I would use axis dot rows. And this is current month, this is three month average, this is difference, and this is variance. So 
So how I have done it, if I right click on these expressions, it's the same expressions you have used. I have exactly used the same expressions. The only thing is I have not used axis.columns, I have used axis.rows and I'm getting three month average. I could use out of box function also, then I would get an option to hide or, or select initial values. I have used the last periods as difference. So again, axis dot rows for variance. I have divided it by the same calculation, uh, and then you are getting that variance. So whatever calculations you have specified, I have used the same one, but instead of using axis dot columns, I have used axis dot rows because in axis dot column I have further column names where I am seeing these calculations as different. So I can see current month, I can see three month average, then difference, then variance, and this would be my division: A division, C division and so on. Uh, so any follow-up questions on this one? So what I will do is I will kind of uh, clean up this DXP and kind of post it. Again, you had used an earlier version. Uh, I am using earlier version. You are using 7.10. Uh, so it's possible uh, it will still work in 7.10. Uh, but I have right now I have 7.8 which I am using, uh, so I will kind of uh, upload this uh, DXP. We have a couple of questions on OSI Pi. Uh, in our 12th September session, we did a walkthrough about OSI Pi, and these have been addressed to Dr. Spotfire hashtag. That's why I wanted to include those here. Uh, so there are a lot of questions on OSI Pi, but uh, in on our 12th September session, you can choose see the YouTube recording, we have kind of covered this, like how we can connect to OSI Pi from Spotfire, um, how that can be connected. You can see your tag data, uh, and uh, we, we kind of covered that there. We would do another kind of uh, session on it if we see more questions coming on OSI Pi. Uh, then we will also kind of, in our next upcoming Dr. Spotfire session, we will uh, go through 7.10 features as well uh, and talk about what is new in Spotfire 7.10. So here is a community article which can kind of help you uh, through, but we will kind of have a proper walkthrough of uh, maybe all these things, like we can go through and walk through of how to kind of export to a PDF, what are the new things. Uh, so in our upcoming Spotfire session, we would uh, kind of talk about 7.10 uh, features. And if we have more questions on OSI Pi or specific questions, not just uh, like whether a connection is possible or not, uh, it is possible. Uh, we can connect to OSI Pi uh, from Spotfire. We can kind of get the tags and uh, that into Spotfire. Uh, but if there are any specific requirements, uh, then uh, kind of feel free to post those. Uh, we can do uh, another featured session on uh, how to connect to OSI Pi, and we might go and dive deep into uh, how to do kind of real-time analytics with OSI Pi, where you can subscribe to tags and um, you might do a OSI by write also. You can write back to the tag, but that won't be spot for. That would be basically real-time uh, analytics using uh, TIPCO stream base. Uh, the, that would be all for today. Uh, do we have any follow-up questions, uh, anything? Uh, we still have two minutes. No, I'd just like to make a comment that I see a lot of people sending us requests for uh, featured content timing. We usually do it at the start of Dr. Spotfire, but a lot of times due to logistical reasons, we also have it near the end. So after the session, you will be prompted to feedback. If there is any particular slot that you prefer for a featured session before the question start or maybe at the end, definitely let us know.